Hi everybody, welcome to this Timeline documentary. My name is Dan Snow and here I am in a Lancaster bomber cockpit, one of the few remaining Lancasters from the Second World War, to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hit, it's like Netflix for history. Hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with many of the world's best historians. Follow the information below this film or just search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. As I was looking at the Bismarck, I saw all these little winking lights and I thought, oh, isn't that pretty? And all of a sudden I realised that what I thought was pretty was death and destruction in the form of about eight tonnes of metal coming my way. The weather had deteriorated considerably and we flew off um, into cloud in snow and appalling, really, flying conditions. 12,000 yards is six nautical miles. Six nautical miles for a ship like this one to us was point blank. At the end of May 1941, some of the world's most powerful warships jeweled in the middle of the Atlantic. It was to be one of the last great battles of the era of naval gunnery. It was a series of brutal encounters, all revolving around the flagship of the German Kriegsmarine, Bismarck. Bismarck is a, is a quantum leap for the Germans, and no, no question. Bismarck is as capable as anything that the British have got. Bismarck is a very impressive warship. She is extremely dangerous. Bismarck was now loose in the Atlantic. The Admiralty were now trying to find whatever ships they could and throw them at the problem. But the British have one job to sink Bismarck. If left unchecked, Bismarck threatened to dominate the Atlantic and starve Britain of the vital food and military supplies that flowed from the rest of the world. The Admiralty had no choice. Bismarck had to be stopped. On Valentine's Day 1939, at the Blum and Voss shipyard in Hamburg, the biggest ship ever built in Europe was launched. It was a triumphant day for Hitler. He had swept to power on the promise of overturning the Treaty of Versailles and returning Germany to a position of pride and power. And now he was christening one of the most powerful ships afloat a stark statement of intent. He concluded his speech. May the German soldiers and officers who will have the honor to command this ship one day prove themselves worthy of the name. The Bismarck. Bismarck is quite a large battleship for her era. She is about 250 metres in length, which is fairly impressive, and 30 metres in the beam, so she's wider than a lot of contemporary battleships. This helps to make her a very steady gun platform. She's able to make a very respectable speed of 29 knots at full speed, and that is quite fast. What's important about that is it's a speed that she can maintain in all weathers. Um, a lot of ships have a rated maximum speed, but it often drops in bad weather. Bismarck can push through and maintain her maximum speed when conditions are rough. Her armament is quite impressive. She has eight 15-inch guns mounted in twin turrets, two forward, two aft. 
Uh, lastly, there's Bismarck's armour and protection scheme. In keeping with traditional German warship building practice, they have emphasised what the more hyperbolic would call unsinkability. She has an incredible amount of internal subdivision, making her very hard to flood and therefore to sink. Her armour protection is comparable to most modern battleships of the era, and not only does she have very impressive protection on the side of the hull with a, a, a fairly dense armour belt, her turrets are very well protected and her command space has a very heavily armoured conning tower. So between all of this, Bismarck is a very impressive warship. She's by no means the best battleship of her generation, but she is extremely dangerous. Bismarck is a, is a quantum leap for the Germans, and no, no question. Um, so prior to Bismarck coming into service, their most powerful ships are, are what they were nicknamed the Twins, the Scharnhorst and Neisenau. These are relatively small. The Germans call them battleships. The British always call them battle cruisers. Actually, what they are is a development of the Panzerschiffe. So they're, they're armed with 11-inch guns. They're quite fast, um, but they're, they're not really a match, on, a one-on-one -on -one for any British battleship afloat at that point. Um, Bismarck is. Bismarck is as capable as anything that the British have got. Radar had designed the Bismarck as a commerce raider. As such, it was probably unstoppable. If Bismarck had broken out into the Atlantic, as other cruisers and, uh, and smaller ships had done throughout 1939 and 1940, the British would have a, a real problem. They had lacked the ships with the firepower to be able to take on Bismarck effectively on the high seas. But it would be two years before Bismarck was ready to threaten the seas. Two years, it would see Western Europe fall almost entirely under Nazi control. The UK had weathered the pounding from the Luftwaffe and avoided invasion by the Wehrmacht. But on the fringes of Europe, she was still desperately vulnerable. Britain now relied on fragile cargo routes that crisscrossed the oceans for her food and vital supplies that allowed her to continue resisting Nazi domination. Grand Admiral Rader, head of the German Navy, had witnessed the successes of the Army and Luftwaffe as they had dominated Central Europe, but also had seen how they'd struggled to subdue Britain. He was keen to remain useful in the eyes of the Führer and add naval victory to Germany's impressive list of achievements. It would now be the turn of the Kriegsmarine to try and break the British. So the, the German Navy in the Second World War, the most important thing to realise about it is it's terribly small. Um, nevertheless, they've used it operationally, um, most notably perhaps in, in Norway in 1940 when they use almost their entire fleet to transport an army and carry out a, a surprise attack on Norway. They have their pocket battleships, the famous Panzerschiffe. They, they go out on commerce raiding missions. They're in place at the beginning of the war. So by 1941, you've got a German Navy that has been probably, to be fair, doing the best it can given the results as it has. The German Navy had been designed on different lines from the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was all about sea power and sea control, controlling the sea lanes and imposing its will on the enemy. Essentially the same thing it had done in the Napoleonic Wars and during the First World War. The Germans were in the business of sea denial, limiting the, the enemy's fleet and pinning it in place, but also then attacking his sea lanes. When we think about the commerce raiding of the Germans in the Second World War, we tend to focus on U-boats and submarines. Um, and clearly that's what does the most damage overall during the war. However, if you are able to put big capital ships to sea as well as submarines, that's the dream ticket in terms of commerce raiding. Because if you want to protect your merchant ships from submarines, what do you do? You group them into a convoy with lots of small warships that are anti-submarine ships around it. Job done. However, if a battleship like Bismarck rocks up, then the battleship can destroy all those small escorts and the convoy. So the only thing that a convoy can do if a battleship like Bismarck appears is scatter. And if it scatters, then all those individual merchant ships can be sunk by submarines. What was a game changer for it um, came in the spring of 1940 with the capture of French ports on the Atlantic. 
particularly Brest, which had a, um, they had dry docks, they had port facilities, which could serve as both a U-boat fleet, but also if German battleships and heavy cruisers broke out into the Atlantic, they could use places like Brest as a base. Radar was quick to take advantage of the newly captured French ports on the Atlantic coast. He based his U-boat wolf packs there and sent them out deep into the Atlantic to prey upon British supply lines. The impact was immediate and devastating. The U-boat captains called this the happy time. Despite these successes, most still believe that only warships on the surface could deal a decisive blow in the campaign. And so as Bismarck underwent its final sea trials, Rada launched Operation Berlin in January 1941. Two fast, powerful battleships, Neisenau and Scharnhorst, swept through the Atlantic from Greenland to the Azores, smashing into Britain's vulnerable shipping lanes. The threat of Germany's surface fleet was now very real. Raider was thrilled with the success of Operation Berlin and desperate to try and repeat it, this time with his new super weapon, Bismarck. Unfortunately for him, there were no other big gunned battleships that were operational, but Bismarck would sail anyway, accompanied only by a squadron of smaller vessels and the heavy cruiser, Prince Eugen. The men in command of Bismarck were Vice Admiral Gunther Lutschens and his captain, Ernst Lindemann. Lutschens had been in charge of Operation Berlin and was now about to lead Germany's most potent naval asset out on another commerce raiding mission, Operation Rheinübung. And so on the 19th of May, 1941, the world's heaviest commissioned battleship slid out of a dockyard on the German-occupied Baltic coast escorted by her consort, Prinz Eugen. On board the Prince Eugen was a small team from the propaganda company tasked with reporting on the mission. Amazingly, with them was a cameraman called Lagerman. Bismarck's maiden operation was filmed. Bismarck wanted to avoid contact with the Royal Navy as much as possible. The plan was to get out into the open Atlantic and start raiding not to engage other capital ships. But to get there completely unseen would prove impossible. Within hours of leaving port, a Swedish cruiser spotted the flotilla sailing west through the Baltic Sea. The Swedish reporter of it not name the ship and contact was lost once it left Swedish waters. The message that made its way to the British Admiralty only read As Bismarck and Prince Eugen slipped out into the North Sea and up towards Norway, the British were already flying reconnaissance sorties over the Scandinavian coast. On the 21st of May, Flying Officer Michael Suttling flew over a fjord near Bergen and took a photograph that sent a chill to the core of the British Admiralty. The size of the ship in the photograph could only mean one thing. Admiral John Tovey put the Royal Navy on high alert. Bismarck was loose. So to understand the Royal Navy in 1941, we, we actually need to rewind quite a bit, actually. Um, actually, let's rewind to 1815 very, very briefly, because at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the, the Royal Navy is the single most powerful dominant force in the world. Um, there's nothing else to touch it, and that's the case for the whole of the 19th century. So the Royal Navy goes into the First World War with a, a new young threat at sea, and also no operational experience fighting sea battles for the best part of 100 years, because there hasn't been anyone to take them on. Lots and lots of lessons are learnt for the Royal Navy during the First World War um, about command and control. Um, and the, the guys who were the, the junior officers commanding ships or first lieutenants of ships in the First World War those are the people who are running the Navy in the Second World War. So they've got the men, 
and they've also got the ships. Um, the, the Royal Navy at the start of the Second World War, it has its gaps, but it's still the most powerful, the most potent Navy in the world. So you've got um, a mix of older ships that are being refurbished, and that's actually a program that is, um, is underway when the war breaks out. The battleships particularly were old. However, five new ones were building in 1941, and two of them, by May, had entered service with the home fleet, the King George V and the Prince of Wales. So that at least gave the British modern speedy battleships. That said, they've got considerable things facing them. Although the Royal Navy is huge, it is very, very stretched. They have gone into the Second World War confident that they could fight the Germans. That's fine. Um, they could fight the Germans and the Italians with the French alongside them, but they lose the French in 1940. So suddenly they're up against the German Navy combined with the Italian Navy and they're doing it on their own. deep beneath the streets of Liverpool now in Derby House and this is one of the most important spaces of the British war effort because it was from here that the British directed operations in the Battle of the Atlantic. Here is where the information was gathered and plotted so that it could be instantly uh, accessible. You've got all the states readiness of aircraft squadrons, of convoys, of naval assets and then those assets would be plotted on this amazing map of the North Atlantic. You've got military vessels and submarines, enemy and allied. You've also got merchant marine, convoys, ONS, that means outbound from Britain. HX means it's left Halifax heading for the UK. It gives commanders here a real-time view of what is going on in this battle space. It is essential to British success in the all-important Battle of the Atlantic. And as such, it was at the heart of that titanic month, May 1941, when the British attempted to catch the Bismarck. It was quite the undertaking. The British home fleet left their base in Scotland. These convoys were stripped of their military escorts. All non-essential missions were cancelled. It was the biggest single naval operation of the Second World War thus far. And at its heart was the pride of the fleet, the Mighty Hood. It was a massive ship, and she was beautiful to look at. She was a wonderful looking ship. You know. She was long and uh, perfectly symmetrical. Two turrets forward, two masts, two funnels, two turrets aft. Marvellous looking ship. I'd never seen anything quite so powerful and beautiful. First one, beautiful for a battleship sounds an awful word, but it's, it, there was no other way to describe her. Hood was pretty much equivalent in size to Bismarck. She was about 860 feet in length, which was a very large vessel indeed. Somewhat slimmer than Bismarck, at only 100 foot in the beam. Uh, she was therefore perhaps best to describe her as an ocean greyhound. She was designed to be fast and she was designed to be very powerful. There's also a similarity in primary armament. She has eight 15-inch guns dispersed in very much the same way we see on the Bismarck. Two twin turrets forward, two twin turrets aft. Hood was quite respectably protected, but her protection scheme was dated. So although her armour was only marginally thinner than Bismarck's in terms of horizontal protection and was actually thicker in places around her turrets, Hood had been designed before the effects of long-range plunging fire had been fully understood. And because she had never had the comprehensive refit that had graced a couple of the Royal Navy's other capital ships, it meant that she went into battle with a scheme of protection that was inadequate to the demands of modern naval warfare. The final element, of course, was her speed. That long, thin hull was meant to purchase a very high speed. And in fact, the reason her upper deck is so low at the stern, uh, it was basically to save weight, to squeeze as many knots as they could out of this design, which had already sacrificed a lot of weight in other directions. As completed, Hood could manage 31 to 32 knots fairly easily, a very high speed for a ship this size. But unfortunately, by 1941, her engines, although maintained, were aging. And unlike Bismarck, she wasn't designed in the same way to cope with very heavy weather. 
So while her printed speed as complete might have been 31 knots, her actual speed in 1941 was probably no better than Bismarck's. It may even have been a knot or so slower. By the start of the Second World War, Hood was probably the most famous warship in the world. During the interwar years, Hood spent most of her time showing the flag. She toured the world and was a floating embodiment of British sea power. She looked powerful, she looked sleek, she looked, above all, she looked elegant. She's the perfect vessel for showing the flag, brass bands playing, cocktail parties, and she'll impress anyone. The trouble was, during that time, she hadn't been overhauled. She could have been modified and improved and rearmored, but she was too useful as, a, as the poster child of British sea power. There is a, a mythical status to Hood that is hard to defend. Um, she is a battle cruiser. This is a, an evolutionary dead end for warships, really, that, that really should have been killed off after the Battle of Jutland when three of them blow up and sink. Their best defence is supposed to be their speed. So they, are, they look like a battleship. Um, they have the same guns as a battleship. They do not have the armour protection of a battleship, and as a consequence, they can go faster. And they're supposed to be used for scouring the oceans of commerce raiders. So you want a battle cruiser to go and find a pocket battleship and sink it. You do not want them standing up in the line against battleships, and they learn this at Jutland. Um, so they don't build any more. And actually, the Royal Navy only enters the Second World War with three of them, um, Hood, Renown and Repulse all of which date back to the, the closing years of the First World War. They are laid down and completed during the First World War. Renown and Repulse actually see service in the First World War and Hood comes in shortly afterwards. Um, so she is built really with problems. She gets this nickname, the Mighty Hood, and she is fundamentally the wrong ship to attach that label to. They really should not have done that. Despite those concerns, Hood, under the command of Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, would be at the head of the strike force against Bismarck and should be accompanied by a brand new battleship, HMS Prince of Wales. The pair were ordered to cruise to the south of Iceland, where she could use her speed to intercept Bismarck whichever route she took to get into the Atlantic. Admiral Toby knew that there were three options available to Lutchens, but still didn't know which he would take. He therefore ordered heavy cruisers to take up positions between Shetland and the Faroes, in the Icelandic Faroe Gap and in the Denmark Straits, the channel of water between Iceland and Greenland. The Royal Navy had set its trap. Whichever way into the rich hunting grounds of the Atlantic that Bismarck and Prince Eugen chose to take, the Navy would be waiting. Whether it was between the Faroes and Iceland or the Denmark Strait, between Iceland and Greenland, the German ships would have to pass through a British net. All these British ships had to do now was keep their eyes open and wait. On the 22nd of May, Bismarck and Prince Eugen were cruising off the coast of Norway and Lutchens needed to decide which passage they would take. He knew that the Royal Navy would be out there somewhere, but he didn't know where. At 1200 hours, he ordered a new course. Bismarck and Prince Eugen would try and break out into the Atlantic through the Denmark Straits. Stationed in the Straits were sister ships, HMS Norfolk and Suffolk. They'd been dispatched there on the 21st of May and their crews had been waiting patiently in foul North Atlantic weather. They would be the tripwire for the entire British plan. Sunday at 20 past seven, from north to my right, sheltered ship, and then two ships. I swam my propellers round, and steamed up fast from behind us, coming up behind us, on the starboard water. This might have been it. What had actually happened is that the, the, the weather, which was closed right down, had suddenly lifted. And they were there on that stubble water, and I know that I know the distance because right behind me in the full control there was a communication person who was repeating uh, messages from the radar office. And although we'd seen them first visually, I heard him say, Echo Berry, Green 140, 12,000, that was 12,000 yards. 12,000 yards is six nautical miles. 
six nautical miles from a ship like this mark to us was point blank. As the German ships are pushing through, they are spotted by the British cruiser HMS Suffolk on patrol in the Denmark Strait. Now Suffolk and Norfolk, they're, they're not powerful enough to engage Bismarck, clearly, but what they can do is absolutely classic cruiser work, which is to find the enemy, report the enemy's presence, and then shadow them. And that's what they do. They, they pick up the Germans. The British have the advantage of radar, so they start to shadow the Germans through the Denmark Strait. The Germans try and throw them off. They know that the risks are there. Um, periodically, Bismarck turns and fires at them. It's, very, it's, it's a dance that the British are very used to. They pull out of range, they pull back in again, and keep methodically following them while heavier forces can be summoned up. Um, and the nearest force that can be brought up um, is HMS Hood, together with the brand new battleship HMS Prince of Wales. The British were planning to steal a march on the Germans, so they in fact uh, went to action stations very shortly after midnight on the morning of the 24th of May. The Germans were at a slightly lower alert level. They, they knew there were British cruisers tailing them, but those cruisers didn't represent an existential threat. They were more of a highly dangerous nuisance. Um, so the Germans were at the next alert level down. What that meant was that some of their crews were able to rest while about two thirds of the crew were closed up. And when they did sight Hood and Prince of Wales, it was a simple matter to go to full action stations and summon the remaining crew to their battle stations. So the state of play when these two forces meet is quite interesting because at the beginning, at the outset, you would think the British have the advantage, actually. Hood, we've discussed, is quite old, um, but she's still got those powerful 15-inch guns. Um, she's got her speed, um, and she's accompanied by Prince of Wales, which is another battleship, brand new, 14-inch gun, quadruple turrets, you know, a, a very powerful unit. Um, set against that, the Germans have Bismarck. Now, Bismarck is also unnew and untried. We tend to forget that. Bismarck and Prince of Wales are both on their first operational deployments. Prince of Wales has been rushed into hers, Bismarck's had a little bit more work up time, but neither of them have fought a battle. Um, and then the Germans have Prinz Eugen, also brand new, heavy cruiser. Realistically, she's pretty outmatched. Um, B uh, Prinz Eugen is not designed to go toe to toe with either Hood or Prince of Wales. The British also have two cruisers. So th there's a stronger British force there. <laughs> Prince of Wales, uh, Hood's consort in this operation, is a brand new battleship. She's one of the new King George V class battleships. These are very powerful warships, they're very well designed, they're reasonably fast, and her presence there should have been enough to ensure a British victory. But there was a lot going on under the surface. The first was Prince of Wales was extremely new. Her crew had only just been assigned, many of them were inexperienced and the ship still had civilian contractors aboard because she'd been rushed into service so quickly and sent out to accompany uh, Hood. So what this meant in practice was you have a ship with a crew who are unfamiliar with her. Um, the ship has not undergone what they would call a shakedown cruise in order to knock her systems into order, um, iron out all the kinks, identify potential mechanical problems and rectify them. None of that's really had a chance to happen. So although on paper Prince of Wales is an extremely powerful asset, she is not all that she seems and in many respects is actually less than she seems. When dawn came and the two sides spotted each other, Hood realised that the Germans weren't quite where he expected them to be. Shortly before, Luchens had altered course. Essentially, he's heading south. Now he's heading more in a southeasterly course. Holland had a decision to make. He could either continue to shadow the German ships and wait for Royal Navy reinforcements to arrive, or he could engage the enemy. At 5.37 a.m., he made his decision he would fight. The message was conveyed back to the Admiralty.
Admiral Holland has no other choice other than to engage Bismarck. That's his job. So the, the German job is to avoid action and to, to get through into the Atlantic. That's Lutchen's job. Holland's job is to stop him. So Holland has to fight a battle. And actually, he's got trained, experienced crews. I think we, we tend to think of the problems with Hood. The advantage of Hood is she's, she's a long-standing, you know, she's been in service for a long time. That's an experienced crew. You know, all, any faults, mechanical faults with Hood have been ironed out long before. You know, very coherent unit that knows what it's doing. And then Prince of Wales is a very powerful new force. So uh, there's nothing wrong with Holland's decision. He has to engage. The men on board the two British capital ships were now preparing for battle. We were all right on the Hood because, I mean, it was the best, it was the finest ship in the world and we were safe. No bother. There was a certain amount of tension, yes. Uh, I wouldn't say we thought it was going to be historic, but we thought the Hood was the best and we would beat the enemy. But uh, as I said previously, there were going to be casualties. You don't go to any action like that without expecting casualties. But once again, it's going to happen to someone else. It's not going to happen to me. And over the loudspeaker system came a voice we didn't know particularly and he said this is the chaplain speaking this was the prayer before Edge Hill O oh Lord thou knowest how busy we shall be today if we forget thee do not thou forget us. Hood was in a lot of danger at the outset of the engagement. It's very obvious from the start that the British are at a disadvantage. They've approached out of position. Uh, the Germans are very fine off Hood's bow, which means that they are crossing the British T. Their full broadside can be brought to bear on the British ships, whereas the British have a, a rather awkward choice to make. They can either turn to match the Germans, in which case you have an engagement where Hood is at a serious disadvantage in terms of her protection, or they can attempt to close the range. However, in closing, only the forward turrets on the Hood and on the Prince of Wales are able to bear. Holland takes this decision, God knows I wouldn't want to take it, to, to push close in as, as fast as possible before going into line. So he accepts the fact that he's going to be outgunned for a while, um, that the Germans will be able to bring all their guns to bear on just his forward guns as they close. So that's the decision he takes. The reason why Holland decides to close is to try and avoid the possibility of plunging fire as quickly as he can. Now, what is plunging fire? That is where you elevate your guns, a bit like a military howitzer, and you fire a shell that goes up in the air and then plunges down. And what that does is if you hit the target, you're going to go through the deck armour rather than the armour belt around the side of the ship. Now, on any warship, that the deck armour is more vulnerable than the armour belt. Um, on Hood, it's a particular problem because um, Hood is a battle cruiser. They have sacrificed armour protection for speed and Hood's deck armour is really, really not up to speed. Now, Holland knows this, um, so what he wants to do is get under, under the plunge as soon as he can blow to blow like boxers, pummeling each other on the belt armour. Fundamentally, he's got two very powerful ships and the Germans only have one very powerful ship. He's pretty confident he can win that. When the radar had first got this range, it was somewhere in the region of about nearly 20,000 yards, I should imagine. And watching this pointer, it was going 20,000, 19,000, 18,000, 17,000, 16,000. If it had been me, being a coward, I should have laid off uh, and ate of the range of the 15-inch guns and probably walloped him from there. And I thought, my goodness, in a minute we will be getting out our cutlasses and going aboard that German and giving him a good old taste of the Nelsons and the Drakes. Hood's huge guns open fire at 0553 hurling enormous projectiles, an astonishing 24 kilometers. But Hood's crew had made a terrible mistake. 
they were firing on the leading German ship, believing it to be Bismarck. But during the night, Bismarck and Prince Eugen had changed position. So for several crucial minutes, Hood was firing at the wrong target. In its own in isolation, it isn't that important. But the problem is, all these little things are these levelling factors that then start to give the Germans an advantage. So you've got some time lost when they're targeting the wrong ship, essentially. Not only does that I mean you're losing opportunities to hit Bismarck, but it's also giving Bismarck a free shoot because they're not being distracted by, by gunfire going off around them and shell splashes in the water. Um, when you add that to um, the, the need to close the range because of Hood's feeble deck armour, the mechanical problems on board the Prince of Wales, all these factors then are starting to, to level things up for the Germans and take away what should have been a British advantage. The crew on board the Prince of Wales made no such error, and despite her mechanical problems, it was the new battleship that scored the first hit. A shell smashed through Bismarck's bow without exploding, but severing fuel lines. Bismarck, like a prize fighter, absorbed the blows. Then Captain Ernst Lindemann barked a command to his gunnery officer Schneider. Permission to fire. At 0555, Bismarck's guns roared. On board the Prince Eugen, the camera captured the huge flares from Bismarck's 15-inch guns, as well as the enormous shell splashes caused by British rounds falling all around the German ships. As I was looking at the Bismarck, I saw all these little winking lights, and I thought, oh, isn't that pretty? Then all of a sudden I realised that what I thought was pretty was death in destruction in the form of about eight tonnes of metal coming my way. Holland had ordered Prince of Wales and Hood to stay pretty close together to better coordinate their fire, but this presented Bismarck with an easier target. Using state-of-the-art Zeiss stereoscopic range-finding equipment, high in the superstructure of Bismarck. The artillery officer observed where his shells were landing and edged them ever closer to the British ship, correcting his fire. Bismarck was closing in. As Bismarck's shells roared overhead, Admiral Holland realised his terrible mistake. He calmly ordered, shift target to the right. His guns would now focus on Bismarck, but he lost valuable minutes. Holland is, is, is doing the best he can with the force that he's got available and I think he's, he's demonstrating a knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of the ships he's got um, and trying to compensate for that in the best way he can. Um, and, you know, these, these smaller factors, they, they happen in battle and I think it's very easy for us to sit there and, and say, well, the lookouts should have done their job better and distinguished between Prince Eugen and Bismarck and, you know, you can argue about all these things, but actually he's got to do the job with the tools he has. There's always a, a strong element of luck um, and some of these things just, just go against him. The cards don't turn in the right way. Another salvo from Bismarck came screaming in. This time, it was a hit. A shell landed in an ammunition store. Luckily, there was not a catastrophic detonation and fires were contained. Prince Eugen also scored a hit on Hood. German gunners smelt blood. At 6 a.m., Admiral Holland made the decision to turn his ship to bring all of his guns to bear. At the same time, Bismarck, at a distance of about nine miles, unleashed another savage salvo. Her monstrous shells dropped all around Hood until one of them scored another direct hit. No one knows where the fatal blow landed. There's no way that we can know. But there are two theories that were advanced at the time and have many supporters today. One is that the shell simply plunged through the decks, which would not be unexpected in terms of what was understood at the time, a plunging fire hit that penetrates through this protection that is not adequate to guard against it, scores a lucky hit in a magazine and starts off a chain reaction which dooms the ship. The other possibility 
is that it might have been what's called a short, where the shell does not actually hit the ship at first, but lands in the water very close by. And what happens in the case of a, a, a hit like that is that the shell has entered the water, um, but by sheer good or bad fortune, depending on whether you're the recipient, um, actually travels beneath the level of the side armor and penetrates the hull below it. That too could have caused the chain reaction that destroyed Hood because of course the bottom of the ship is where the magazines are and if a heavy shell like that gets through and causes a fire then you have problems. It's interesting to note that one of the Hood survivors stated that as Hood was making her turn and was able to finally unmask her rear gun batteries, uh, X turret, the third one from the bow, fired, Y turret remained strangely silent. So it's entirely possible that whatever was going wrong had begun to go wrong at that point. Uh, regardless, within the next few minutes, uh, everyone saw the explosion which destroyed Hood. Witnesses to that fateful moment say that a flame like a, a blowtorch flared up into the sky followed by an almighty explosion. Hood disintegrated. I personally didn't hear any explosion at all. Again, the ship shuddered and we were all thrown off our feet. And all I saw was a gigantic sheet of flame which shot round the front of the compass platform. After, after the hit, you, you heard the screams and the uh, noise of, uh, 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 of the carnage that was going on. There was no order given to abandon ship, it wasn't necessary. On the horizon of the Prince Eugen film, distant smoke from the stricken hood can be seen. Witnesses likened the devastation to what happened to HMS Barham just six months after hood. It too saw its magazines explode, ripping the ship apart. And in the corner of my binoculars where I could see, we were so close, I could see the hood. All of a sudden there was a huge, great orange flash. And then when I looked out from my binoculars to where the hood was, there was no hood. Hood was ripped in half. The stern section sank within seconds. The bows rose vertically up into the air. The guns fired one last eerie salvo, a final act of defiance from a doomed gun crew. Within three minutes, the mighty Hood, the pride of the Royal Navy, the most famous ship in the world, sank beneath the waves. Of 1,418 men on board, only three survived. We received information that the hood had been, had been sunk. That sounded impossible. And we waited for confirmation. And we were very anxious that we should serve the guns quickly because if the hood had been sunk, then we had a, would have a double job. As the crew of the Prince of Wales watched in horror as their comrades were sucked beneath the waves, the reality of their own position now suddenly dawned on them. They were one British ship facing two Germans. In the next four minutes, seven shells smashed into Prince of Wales. The situation was getting desperate. We had had a 15-inch shell go through the bridge and explode as it was going out and killed an awful lot up there. And a boy of 16 thinks that being wounded is a nick in the shoulder. But I, in my keenness, I was very, very keen in those days. Went to do what I was supposed to do and start tidying up the bridge. And I went in and um, expecting to see people. And um, the first thing I saw as I went in, the wood panelling was just little bits of flesh spattered all around. And that was a very, very big shock to me. I don't think I ever got over that. Less than 10 minutes after Hood had slipped beneath the waves, Captain John Leach of the Prince of Wales decided that the odds were stacked too heavily against him. 
he ordered a hard turn to port and for his ship to make an escape. And then to our dismay at about ten past six, the captain came on scene. I remember his words. Hood's blown up, broken in two and sunk. Now the hood was a legend in the Navy, as most people would know. And we were told that the Prince of Wales had had to withdraw to, re to repair its damage. And there, it left Suffolk and Norfolk on the road. This Mark and Prince Oigan. So he did look a very, very happy situation. The British have been terrified about what Bismarck might have been capable of if it was unleashed on the Allied supply routes across the Atlantic. And now, in the space of just a couple of minutes, firing just a few salvos, Bismarck hadn't sunk some unarmed merchant ship, but the pride of the Royal Navy. Britain's worst fears had been realised. HMS Norfolk, that had been shadowing the battle, sent a simple communique back to the Admiralty in London. They released a terse note that same evening. During the action, HMS Hood received an unlucky hit in a magazine and blew up. There was nothing really in the British psyche that could replace a loss uh, so, so dramatic of such a prestigious warship. It was essentially a huge slap in the face to British pride and a uh, British sense of s naval superiority. Uh, the world had almost turned upside down. What on earth could the, could the Bismarck do next? The Royal Navy itself is not going to be super surprised by this. One of the things that has allowed the Royal Navy to be so dominant for so many centuries is, is culturally they have always seen ships that are assets to be used and when you use assets, you might lose them. This isn't the first ship the Royal Navy have lost in action. Politically, um, and in terms of domestic morale, it's devastating. The, the Hood has gone, and the Hood hasn't just gone, she's gone in seconds and taken almost her entire ship's company, other than three men, down with her. So that is a, a really significant problem. And you have to look at the wider context without trying to, to divert us too much. This is not a point where the war is going well for the British anyway. So from Churchill downwards, this has to be avenged. It has to be very publicly avenged. In Germany, the news that Hood had been sunk was met by widespread jubilation. Goebbels made the most of it. It was a huge propaganda coup. Bismarck uh, had bested the most famous warship in the world and the pride of the British fleet. So there was no stopping uh, Germany, which could now break out in the Atlantic and destroy Allied convoy routes. That was the message coming out of Germany. Uh, Hitler was delighted. His, his support of radar had been vindicated. And for the moment, everything looked rosy. When word of Bismarck's success was radioed back to Germany, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, immediately broadcast it to the nation. Germany now had a huge maritime victory to cheer, alongside its remarkable run of conquests on the European continent. The Schlachtschiff Bismarck has hierbei einen englischen Schlachtkreuzer, wahrscheinlich Hood, vernichtet. The British were devastated. But that disappointment didn't breed despondency. Instead, the Admiralty were gripped by an iron determination. Every ship, every asset was now redirected to one very simple end. To sink the Bismarck. We turned in and made our attack down to 90 feet, dropped the fish, turned hard downwind, 
and jinked all over the sky. And of course, the ship itself, you could see all the guns firing at you in the tracer in green, red, orange, white, all coming towards you. Suddenly, there were great eruptions of spray going up in the air. And, and we realized that she was firing her main armament at us.